Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us for our service here at First Baptist Church. My name is Pastor John Pickens, and uh, we just want to say welcome. If you are watching this video for the first time or maybe for the last couple times uh, and have enjoyed our service, we, we would really like to get to know you. And I know this; these are unusual times, and it's very difficult to do this. Um, but we have provided a link down in the description of this video here on YouTube for you to fill out a connection card. It's just some basic information for us to get to know you and how we might be able to best serve you during this time. Enjoy the service. Well, welcome uh, to another service here at First Baptist Church of Lowell. We're glad that you have joined uh, with us today to worship and uh, join with us to hear the word preached. Uh, today, I want to begin by reading and call to worship out of the Psalms. Uh, so let's look at this together. We read, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. What I love about that psalm is it's a reminder that sometimes what we need to do is we need to sort of command ourselves uh, to worship and then remind ourselves that the reason that we worship is because of who God is. So let's sing together uh, this song that praises God for his holiness. Oh 
Amen. We read this uh, also in the Psalms. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. That psalm teaches us that uh, the reason the righteous will never be moved is because the, the person in whom we place our faith will never be moved. So let's celebrate that reality together, that Jesus is our cornerstone. Savior's love 
through the storm. He is Lord, the Lord of all. It's because we know that Jesus is our cornerstone, that God has guaranteed and proved his faithfulness in him, that we can wait. Even when God seems to be distant, when he seems to be slow in answering, uh, we can wait, knowing that he will come and that he will deliver. And that's what Psalm 33 reminds us of. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. depths I cry to you. In darkest places I will call. Incline your ear to me anew. And hear my cry for mercy, Lord. Were you to count my sinful ways, how could I come before your throne? Yet full forgiveness meets my gaze. I stand redeemed by grace alone. And I will wait for you. So put your hope in God alone. Take courage in his power to save. Completely and forever one. By Christ emerging from the grave. Surely wait for you, for your love. 
Well, at this time, we want to encourage you to pray uh, either by yourself or with whoever you're listening to, and we'd like to uh, especially focus on praying for our missionaries uh, today. So there's going to be a slide about two of our missionaries that we support, and we want to be praying for them, and there'll be specific things that you can be praying for on these slides. So let's uh, take some time and pray together.
I think one of the hardest things for us to do, um, especially during this time where we have a uh, pandemic uh, and, uh, man, our lives are being limited and, and that sort of thing, um, is, is wait on the Lord. But I would just strongly encourage you as a follower of Jesus Christ to use this time to, to wait and, and pray and, uh, and lean in um, to Christ and the fact that he is a sovereign God uh, during this time. Very difficult to do. A matter of fact, our, our patience really is never tested until it's actually tested, right? And so when you start to get anxious, that's probably the, that's when patience actually begins to kick in. That's when we need to wait even uh, more. And so I just encourage you to use this time to wait on the Lord. Cancer is a horrible disease. It is one that forms in our bodies and we don't even know it at times until the symptoms get so bad that it, um, it begins to reveal itself. What makes it so bad is that it can spread and sometimes spread even fast. Cancer cells break off from its place of origin and they travel through the blood and lymph system and they metastasize in other parts of our body. Oftentimes someone will discover that the cancer has metastasized all throughout their body and there's nothing left to do apart from divine intervention. Nothing's going to stop it. And at this point, cancer is terminal. It's a nasty disease. It's, it's one of those diseases that I know that our people, many of our people have been through I know that many of our people currently are going through, have cancer and are battling. And then I also know it's a, it's a battle that many of our people have lost. The chances of you knowing somebody that has, has been lost to cancer is, is huge. It's a nasty disease. And that's exactly what I think of when I think of sin. Sin is a cancer it infects the entire soul. It is an incurable cancer that all of us have. Apart from a divine intervention, it will ruin us. We've been in the book of Romans, and so far the Apostle Paul has gone through with great, in great length to make sure that um, the reader understands that every person, whether you are a pagan Gentile, whether you are a moralist, or whether you are a religious Jew, every single person is in the same boat. They are under the condemnation of God. They deserve God's wrath. And apart from a righteousness that is revealed in the gospel, we have no hope. Only God can cure this problem. You know, by now, I would imagine you're probably thinking, come on, pastor, I get it. Like, I'm a sinner. Can we just move on? And uh, I, to, be, to be honest, I feel that same way uh, as we're traveling through Romans chapter um, one, two, and three, this has been a, a repeated theme over and over and over again as Paul is making a very careful argument to these uh, people. He's, but in this particular appeal, this final appeal to the people before he transitions into the righteousness of Christ, um, he's revealing something about sin that, that we need to understand. It's not just, hey, I'm a sinner, I know that, no. Paul wants you to understand just how deeply affected you are by sin. And that's what we're going to do today. My goal is to teach this passage and lead us to wrestle with how deeply um, broken we are and how desperately we are in need of Jesus Christ. So let me read the passage for you. In verse 9, Romans chapter 3, verse 9 says this. What then? Are we Jews any better off? Not at all. For we've already made the charge that both Jews and Greeks are under sin. 
as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world made accountable or held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Let's pray together as we open the word. Father, this is an incredible passage that teaches us just how deeply affected we are by sin. And so, Father, as we look into this final appeal by Paul, Father, I pray that you would help us to wrestle with our own brokenness. And Father, ultimately, I pray that you would deepen our appreciation and love for the Lord Jesus Christ as our only hope. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so I want to look at the relationship between sin, the law, and righteousness out of this passage. And we're going to start with verse 9. Verse 9 says, What then? Are we Jews any better off? Now, I want to stop there and talk about this for a second. Uh, if you remember last week um, in verse 1, the, Paul asked a question that was very, very similar to this. Um, and, it, it, and the question revolved around um, the value of being Jewish. Is there, is there any advantage to being a Jew or any value in circumcision? And, and Paul's answer was, well, yes, there there is value to being uh, Jewish because he lists, first of all, you, you've been entrusted with the oracles of God. And so there is value to being Jewish. But yet in this particular verse, in verse 9, he, he's, this, the question is so similar but different in, in this aspect. He says, what then? Are, are we Jews any better off? Better off than who? Well, he's talking about better off than Greeks or Gentiles. Anybody that's non-Jewish. Right? And, and, and better off, what, is, what does he mean by better off? The second part of that sentence tells us, uh, gives us a clue, says, for we've already made the charge that both Jews and Greeks are under sin. And, and so this whole context of this whole argument that started in verse uh, 18 of chapter 1 is that everyone is under the wrath of God. All of us deserve to be condemned. And, and so are we... Are, Jew, are Jews better off in that regard? And Paul says, no, not at all. We've already made the charge that Jews and Greeks are under sin. And so if you're taking notes, uh, understand this, that every person alive is under the curse of sin. What does that mean? What does that look like? Even in this particular um, chapter, Paul uses the phrase under sin. It, it pictures this relationship to sin, um, that, that our relationship to sin is that of a, of a slave master. Sin is our slave master and has us under its thumb. Matter of fact, John Stott said it this way, Paul appears almost to personify sin as a cruel tyrant who holds the human race imprisoned in guilt and under judgment. Sin is on top of us weighs us down, and is a crushing burden. And, and so I believe Paul is communicating just how deeply affected by sin that we are. We are not just people who sin. We are sinful to the core. We are under sin, which then expresses itself outwardly in various ways. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that by nature we are objects of God's wrath. We are sinful to the core. That's who we are. We're not just people who do sin. We are under sin, the curse of sin. 
I, I think one of the preassumptions that our culture makes about human beings is that we're basically good. And you've probably heard that. You might even think that. And, and the idea is that, that people are, the idea that people think that they're basically good actually blinds them to see their need for the Savior. And, and the reality is that many people can't fathom a God that would eternally condemn somebody that is basically good, that just doesn't sit well with our senses. This, however, is not what the Scriptures teach. And I think it's important for us to understand this. Let's look at how deep sin, has, how deeply sin has affected our lives as human beings. Romans 3, 10 through 12 Um, Paul quotes Psalm 14 to make this point. In in verse 10, he says this, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Not even one. And so, Paul is using Psalm 14 to speak to these Jews to say, listen, listen. If, if you were to read Psalm 14, it is the psalmist looking out at these Gentiles and, and, and seeing how wicked they are. And, they, and, and there's none righteous, there's not one, no one who understands. All have turned aside, become worthless. No one does good, not even one. They are people who are apart from God and and, and, and yet Paul is saying, listen, you're not any better off. We're in the same boat. We're just like these Gentiles. No one is righteous, not even one, apart from Christ. And, and so if you're taking notes, to be under sin means that we have all turned away from God. And see, this is essentially what the issue is about being basically good. See, basically good... Um, assumes only a moral uh, premise. But the reality is we've actually turned away from God, and that, and, and that is the epitome of wickedness. And it manifests itself in, in various ways. Matter of fact, he goes on in the Psalms, uh, or in this passage, to quote, string together several Psalms and uh, a, a verse from Isaiah several scriptures to make an even greater point. I, th- I think not only have we all turned away from God, but there's, there's something about sin that is, is incredibly horrible. And so what I, what I did, as, as I read this, I want you to notice that I'm going to underline words that I want you to see so you can kind of see what, what Paul's doing here, okay, when he's using these verses and, uh, and, and I put the, the verse reference so that you can um, reference it yourself if you would like to. Uh, so here's, here's what Paul does. Ready? He says, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their what? Lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood in their past um, are ruin and, mis- and in their past are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, Paul is using a, um, a, a method that is not uncommon to a rabbi, and that is stringing together passages from the Old Testament to make a point. And here's the point I believe that Paul is making. To be under sin means that every part of who you are is deeply affected by sin. If you look at this passage, what you will find is that he strings together all these passages that have body parts. It's your throat, it's your tongue, it's your lips, it's your mouth, it's your feet, it's your eyes. It doesn't, every single part of you is affected by sin. We are deeply affected by sin. It's, it's where we get the term total depravity. And that term can um, be a little bit misleading because some people 
will look at that term and just kind of cringe and, and, and be like, what, but there, there's some good things that people do. And total depravity doesn't say that you are completely, horribly wicked. It manifests itself all the time. But it, what it means is that every single part of you, every aspect of your life is deeply affected by sin. And we're going to talk about those later on in the message when we explore our own brokenness. But every part of us is deeply affected by sin. That's the idea of total depravity. Now, I want to move on to verse 19. Verse 19 says this, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Remember that he talks about everybody being under sin. Now he's speaking to these Jews and and says, uh, we know that whatever the law says speaks to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be accountable to God. So as you're you're looking at this particular verse um, and you're taking notes, you can go ahead and, and write this down. Being under the law does not exempt you from being under sin, but rather makes you accountable for being under sin. Now, I want to unpack that a little bit. When he says that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. What does he mean by this word law? And and I think it's important for us to understand this because the New Testament uses the word law in several different ways. The, the two ways it probably uses the, the concept of law uh, most is one, it would be talking about um, the first five books of the Old Testament. Um, and they might, um, might even be referring to the Mosaic Covenant within that, okay? Or you, it's used, law is often used to talk about the entire Scripture, okay? Now, I believe that Paul is using this word right here specifically to talk about the entire scripture. Why? Because he just quoted a bunch of Psalms and one of the prophets. He didn't even go into the Mosaic law. He didn't go into the first five books of the Bible. He's quoting these Psalms and Isaiah, and, and immediately he says, we know that whatever the law says, I just, I just spoke the law, I just quoted to you, strung together these things to talk about how um, deeply depraved we are deeply affected by sin that we are, every part of us, it speaks to those who are under the law, meaning those um, who are Jews specifically, as, he's, as that's his audience at this particular point in the letter, um, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world be held accountable to God. So, um, so basically what Paul's saying is this, that being under the law doesn't exempt you from being under sin. You still understand. Yeah, you might be under law. You might, as a Jew in the Old Testament, you might be under law, but that doesn't exempt you from being under sin. Matter of fact, it actually holds you accountable for being under sin. So what is the law speaking about relative to our condition? As we've seen earlier, everyone, regardless of ethnicity, whether you are a Jew, whether you are a Greek, doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, all of us are held accountable for our, our unrighteousness. And, and understand this, I want, maybe, maybe I'll say it this way, that just because a Jew is under law doesn't make them not under sin. They're still under sin, and that's their fundamental pro- that's all of our fundamental problem and so the the law cannot change that condition it only holds us accountable for being under sin i'm going to move on to verse 20 verse 20 says this for by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin now there's some concepts here in this particular verse that I, uh, that I want to work through, and we're going to stay on this verse for um, a little while. But works of the law, what does he mean by works of the law? Works of the law are, are external human actions done in obedience to whatever the Hebrew Scriptures demand. 
okay? So when you're looking at the Hebrew Scriptures, which is, would be our Old Testament, okay? You're looking at the Hebrew Scriptures, whatever external human action, whatever, whatever that it, it's saying, hey, this is, this is what you're to do, this is what you're not to do, um, these are, these are, it could, it could mean sacrifices, it could mean all kinds of things, just works of the law, the things that the Hebrew Scripture says, this is what I want you to do, okay? You know, here's what's, what's important about that, it is, is that, that following those, this is the argument he's making, is that following the works, or doing the works of the law, actually participating in the works of the law, in and of itself, does not take care of your sin problem. And he says it this way. He says that, that no human being, by, by works of the law, no human being will be justified. And that's the word I want to talk about next. What is justified? Justified, at, at its base meaning, means to be declared righteous. That God declared you righteous. Or, or in even a judicial sense, it means that you are vindicated of your offense. Or you're being declared just not guilty. And so what Paul is saying here is that by works of the law, just by mere obedience to what the Scriptures say, will not justify you in God's sight. Matter of fact, it was that very law, it's through the Scriptures that we see or gain a knowledge of sin. The Scriptures reveal to the reader what sin is, and how deeply it affects every one of us. Matter of fact, it does the very opposite of justification. Now get this. Works of the law, no human being will be justified. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin, so it it doesn't bring justification. It It actually justifies our own condemnation, is what it does. And so here's the point. The law was never intended to bring justification before God. The law was never intended to bring justification before God. And so just by mere obedience to the Scriptures, and that even applies for us. Following the Bible in external obedience does not deal with our under-sin problem. Thus, it cannot change our guilty standing before God. Legalism is when we, we try to do things in order to change that reality. We think we have to do these certain things in order to gain favor with God, in order to become um, in, in a right standing with God. No, the law was never intended to bring justification before God. And Paul, I believe, makes that very clear. Now, I want to I transition to talk about this practically. I want us to kind of wrestle with our under, uh, wrestle with our own understanding of our brokenness, and so this is what I'm going to say to that, uh, <laughs> and that is that you are not as good as you think you are. You are not as good as you think you are. Now I know that is not a very um, cooth thing to say. Uh, matter of fact, it's fairly provocative that you are not as good as you think you are. But hear me out for a minute. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at three areas of our life that, that bear this out. Okay, One, I, I think, is one of the most significant areas, and that is worship. Worship is deeply affected by sin. Worship is deeply affected by sin. Here's how. Ready? In worship, we struggle making Worship more Christ-centered than me-centered. Our natural bent is to make worship me-centered. I mean, whether it be talking about a corporate worship setting where we have music and we have our own preferences and we get all bent out of shape if there's a different kind of style or whatever, we, we, make, we make worship more about me. Uh, or if you are serving in a worship service or just serving in general because serving is an act of worship all right and and you're and you're doing it because it makes you feel good or you want 
you want to kind of draw attention to yourself. This, that's, that's what sin does. That's, what, that's where sin takes us. We, we struggle with this of making, we struggle taking worship off of ourselves and throwing it on Christ where it should be. Sin deeply affects our worship. Well, we, we also struggle with loving other things. Right, the epitome of worship is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That is the epitome of worship. And, and yet we struggle with loving other things more than that. This is idolatry. This is what, if you read your Old Testament, idolatry was all over the place. I mean, this was the huge sin of Israel. Is that the God of Israel who brought them out of Egypt miraculously, powerfully, they loved other things more than God. And that's sin at work in our lives. We love material wealth. You know, I, I, I would say that uh, even times like this where we sh- are struggling economically will help reveal some of that in our own heart. That we actually do, in some ways, love money, and possessions, more than we love God or we trust in them more than we trust in our God we struggle with loving pleasure more than God we'd rather um, spend our times pleasing ourselves than spend our times pursuing Christ we all struggle with that and that's part of sin at work in our lives we love power more than God. We love praise from people more than we love God. We struggle to trust in God's goodness and provision. And man, isn't this so true in times like this where money gets a little bit tight? Um, there's a sphere of the virus that is affecting um, a lot of people. And it's affecting the economy. And uh, we're, we're struggling to trust in God's goodness and provision. Sin moves us in that direction. We often condition our worship based on what God has done for us lately. I mean, think about this, right? Like when everything is good in our lives, it's like praise Jesus but what happens when suffering comes in? What happens when all of a sudden things are taken away from us? All of a sudden our, our mind is like, what? You know what? But God, <laughs> what are you doing to me? You know, don't you know this is me? <laughs> I mean, we condition our worship. God, as long as things are going well for me and I'm not suffering and I'm not going through hardships in my life, Even though I know they're everywhere. As long as I'm not going through those things, I'll worship you. We condition it. That's sin. That's sin at work in our lives. It's how deeply affected we are by sin and it affects our worship. Not only does it affect our worship, but it affects our ability to love one another deeply. It affects our ability to love one another in this way. Ready? We are stubborn. And we don't easily humble ourselves. So when we're in relationships, we constantly butt heads, right? (laughs) Whether it be uh, um, a conflict that's happening face-to-face, whether it is social media, it doesn't matter what it is, we are stubborn and we don't humble ourselves very easily. Matter of fact, I would venture to say that most of us are like, man, well, i got to be right. It's more important for me to be right than to be humble. That's sin at work in our lives. We get easily angered when things don't go our way. <laughs> Your agenda changes. Listen, our, all of our agendas have changed <laughs> over the last month. Matter of fact, um, I think the hardest part about pastoring, in my own opinion, 
is, is I want to be around people, but it has totally changed my whole rhythm that I, uh, that I love and have established. Um, and um, that, that's hard, but we get easily angered when things don't go our way and we take it out on people. It's sin at work. We don't easily forgive people of offenses towards us. Matter of fact, we would rather make them pay. We would, we would rather um, hold them to their offense and punish them. Get revenge than actually forgive them. That's sin at work in our lives, in our heart. We, we often... <laughs> this is... This is I think it's important for you to understand. And, and mo- most of us don't think this way, but if you start evaluating, I, I think you will come to find out that this is true, that we often look for what we can get out of a relationship rather than what we can give. We often look for what we can get out of a relationship rather than what we can give. Let me think about that for a minute. I'm going to spend time and hang out with these people because they make me laugh. They, <laughs> I enjoy that, but I don't really talk to this group over here or these people because it's kind of awkward. They don't give me anything. These people are giving me something. You're not giving me anything. So we, we can, <laughs> we, and, it's, and, it, and it goes further than that. When you just look at your relationships, we often function as if we're, we're, we're trying to get from the relationship rather than give in the relationship. But see, that's sin um, working in, in and through our, our lives. And oftentimes, here's the thing. Here's the nasty thing about sin, right? Because sin is a part of our condition, not just something we do. Oftentimes, we don't even realize we're doing this. We're not consciously, we're not consciously saying, well, I'm going to try to get out of a relationship rather than give. We're not consciously thinking this way. But, this is, but sin is still at work in our lives. <laughs> Even though we're not making a conscious decision uh, for it. This is how deeply affected we are by sin. We're under the curse of sin. And it affects our relationships. And then the third thing is it affects our understanding what it means to be human. Our understanding of what it means to be human is deeply affected by sin. Here's what I mean by that. You were created in the image of God. He made you that way. Sin messed that up. Sin has tainted the image. Hadn't changed the image. We're still the image bearers of God. We didn't cease to be the image bearers of God just because of the fall. In the garden, we're still the image bearers of God. How has it tainted our own understanding of being an image bearer? We get jealous. And we compare ourselves to other people. Folks, that's sin at work in our lives. We sink into pride and think of ourselves more than we ought. Matter of fact, we come to a point where we actually think we're better We're better than you. I'm a better person than you. That's pride. And we sink into it. And it's sin. We begin to believe that we are worthless and have nothing to offer. Isn't it interesting that sin can move us in a direction where we think too much of ourselves and sin can move us in a direction where we see ourselves as worthless, which is not thinking of yourself rightly in terms of an image bearer of God. You're an image bearer of God. He created you to bear his image. That has meaning and purpose in and of itself. Much less the fact that you are a child of God as a believer in Jesus Christ and you have a new identity as an image bearer of God. Uh, of God, you are his child. You, I mean, we can just name a whole list of this, this stuff, but sin moves us into this um, place where we see ourselves as worthless and have nothing to offer. We struggle to feel loved 
and feel like we don't belong anywhere. And I know that's a real, real feeling. But see, this is what sin does in our lives. It begins, it's at work. It's at work, um, working on you to believe a lie. To believe that God is not there for you when He promised He was and is there for you presently. We struggle to feel like our life has no meaning or purpose. And there are so many other ways that sin affects our sense of identity. Whether it be our understanding of what it means to be a man or a woman, all of those things are effects, negative effects of sin. It's a sin at work in our lives to move us away from what is really true about us. Our understanding of what it means to be human is deeply affected by sin. So the, the point is, the reality is, you're just not as good as you think you are. Second thing I'm, I'm going to say about this, I want you to wrestle with, is that not only are you not as good as you think you are, but there is nothing that you can humanly do to justify yourself before God. There's absolutely nothing you can do humanly to justify yourself before God. Your good works don't measure up. They never will. No matter what good things that you do, how often you do them, they are never going to measure up. They're never going to change your condition. They're never going to justify you before God. Not only that, but your religious rituals will not justify you before God. It doesn't matter how often you come to church. It doesn't matter um, in, in terms of justification. Now, do I think these things matter? Yes, I think good, doing good things matter. I think, I think going to church matters. Why? Because even Paul says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. But what I'm saying is that, that it brings no value in justifying you. So it doesn't matter how often you attend church, whether you've been baptized, whether you take communion, whether you read your Bible at home, it doesn't matter. All those things will not justify you before God. You can't do anything humanly. You, you, from a human perspective, you can't do anything to justify yourself before God. Or even your wishful thinking won't change a thing. And I, and I see this, I'll have conversations with people and they just, when they think about eternity... They'll say, you know what, I, I believe that there's a God. But I just believe that, you know, God is just going to be fair here. My, my good has outweighed my bad. And God, God's just going to be fair. And See, that's just wishful thinking because God has already said that's just not true. He's been clear about that in His Word. So you can't do anything humanly possible to justify yourself before God. The only thing that can make a difference is Christ. And this is where Romans leads us. And this is the final point I'm going to make today. And it's just a quick point because we're going to be talking about this for <laughs> a lot of weeks. <laughs> that Christ and His righteousness is all we need. And Romans is going to teach us about this righteousness, how to live in this righteousness, the benefits that we have from this righteousness, our identity as um, a person who is um, surrounded by the righteousness of Christ. And so we're going to spend many, many weeks on this subject. But here's the point today, because I can't leave it as, you're not as good as you think you are. I can't leave it that way, right? Because Paul's overarching argument is that, yeah, you're not as good as who you are. You're under sin. Sin is so deeply affected. You, you, you're worthy of condemnation. But your only hope, and there is hope, but your only hope is Christ. Romans chapter 7, verse 22 through 25 says this. It says, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin, 
that dwells in my members. This is what he says about himself. Ready? Wretched man that I am. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Because that's what it feels like. Sin has so deeply affected my life that it feels like a body of death. I am so wretched. Who will rescue me? Verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ is our deliverer. He went to a cross. He died in obedience to His Father. He died to rescue us from our condition of being under sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. He makes us righteous before Him. We're actually going to talk about that um, next week. But here's what I'll say. is If you're listening to this um, message, and you have never come to a point where you have placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I would invite you um, to do so. I would love to have a conversation with you. I'd love to get in contact with you. Uh, on the bottom of the screen here is going to be um, our email address. If, if you need counsel, you want to, uh, to start a relationship with Christ, I would love to um, start that conversation and get a hold of you. Uh, so feel free to email me. I get that email. I will make sure that uh, I get a hold of you. And um, I would love you know, to pray with you and to show you from the Scriptures what it means to have a relationship with Christ. And I would also love to just resource you um, as you would grow in your relationship with Christ. So um, utilize that email address. And the other thing that I'll say to those of you who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, perhaps you've not really wrestled with how deeply sin affects your life. But I think this is why David, who I think was acutely aware of how much sin affected his life, would say something like, search me, O God, and know my heart. And then, and then after you search me, God, reveal that to me. Show me. And lead me to the way everlasting. Wrestle with this. And, and may it bring you to a point of deeper appreciation for the love of God that was shown through Jesus Christ. The mercy of God revealed in the cross. May it deepen our appreciation and our love for Jesus. Father, I thank you for the time that we can just get into your word. Even, even a passage like this, Father, that just seems like a lot of bad news. It's actually, it's actually the Apostle Paul loving us so much, he's going to tell us the truth. We're just not as good as we think we are. We are desperately in need of Christ. And so, Father, I pray that as we wrestle with this, I pray for those that that may not know Christ, that are listening to this, Father, that, that you would draw them to yourself, that they would see that they are desperately in need of deliverance from their own sin, and that that deliverance comes through Jesus. Would you draw them to yourself? And Father, for those that do know you, Father, I pray that you would deepen their own awareness of their sin and deepen their own appreciation for your goodness. And, and uh, may our love for you just grow because of your grace and your mercy that's been lavished upon us. Father, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close with a song <clears throat> that is uh, it's really a prayer that God would uh, help us be faithful to him. And uh, I think it fits well with Pastor John's message in the sense that uh, sin is deceptive and it easily uh, 
deceives us into thinking that we're better than that, better than we are. And uh, and so let's sing this together and commit ourselves to being faithful uh, to our Lord. Thank you for joining us for our online service, and um, I just want to draw your attention to some questions that we encourage you to uh, wrestle with, whether it's you as an individual or the people that you are watching this video with. We'd encourage you to have some discussion if you're in a, in a group uh, as a family, um, or just wrestle with them individually. Uh, they're going to be on the screen. We're going to we're going to just have them on there for a few seconds, and pa you can hit pause on your uh, device that you're watching from, and uh, have a great time of discussion as you uh, wrestle with these. The, I, I did not make one for older kids this um, this week because I felt that the, all the reflection questions that are there are geared for everybody, and so um, blessings. <laughs> 